Welcome to this presentation of Design for Additive Manufacturing. Uh, my name is Jeremy Owen. I'm sales manager for RP America. And uh, this is just a collection of thoughts that I had uh, put together uh, from some information that I have collected uh, over the years. So I want to start with uh, designing for additive manufacturing. It's really as simple as this. We need to think differently. So let's talk about why we may use additive manufacturing. Traditionally, the cost of traditional manufacturing, uh, the more components you create, the cheaper those components become. Additive manufacturing stays relatively flat if you're in a production setting. Now, when we start talking about the complexity of that part, the more complexity in a component, the more expensive it becomes to manufacture. Well, Additive manufacturing, again, stays relatively flat. Let's look at some complex structures. So here's a difficult structure. It would be nearly impossible to uh, fabricate in, with traditional manufacturing. So the question is, can this be created with traditional manufacturing? Short answer is no. Let's also have a look at right angles in nature. This is about as close to a right angle as you're gonna find in nature. So why don't we see right angles in nature? Because they're really not necessary. Nature itself has determined what shape and size and the geometry needs to look like in order to do the job. This is why we don't really see these right angles in nature. So why do we design that way? Why don't we think the way nature does? Traditionally, it's because we are educated and we're conditioned that way. We have been using subtractive manufacturing for so long that this is the way we know how to do things. When it comes to additive, we need to think a little bit differently. So let's look at some traditional subtractive manufacturing materials. We have bar stock, raw stock, flat plate, tubes, angles, uh, all of them have right angles. Even circular tubes, if you cut them square on the end, there's still right angles there where the thickness of the material is. About traditional manufacturing operations or subtractive, uh, milling, turning, machining, flame cutting, bending, welding. These are all operations that work well with the materials that we typically use. So with traditional manufacturing, all of these processes and materials, they're designed to complement each other. To best understand design for additive, we also need to understand the process for additive. And this understanding is crucial to the success for AM. So what do we need to do? We need to think differently. We need to throw away our old design rules we need to evolve as engineers and designers. And we need to take those handcuffs and get rid of them. The, the handcuffs of subtractive manufacturing is what holds us back today. So let's look at a little information about how we can change this. So this is a traditional injection mold. Uh, it's actually for an old plastic camera. Uh, they're going to pump plastic in here, uh, hot liquid plastic, and create that. So in order to keep this at a good temperature and make the mold more efficient, we need to cool this down. And this is typically how we do that. We will take a drill and we will drill holes along the sides, along one end, and then we're going to plug weld the, those so we can actually pump some coolant or water or whatever that coolant's going to be through there. And that's going to allow us to keep a cooler um, mold that's typically made out of metal. It's not very efficient. You don't get consistent cooling. You may have hot spots. You may have cold spots. It, it all depends. So is there a better way? What about this? What if we had drill bits that could turn corners? That would be nice. We don't have those, but this is going to give us a lot more efficiency because we're more closely fitting the contour of the shape. 
when you remove those limitations of subtractive manufacturing, how would you do it? This is just one idea. What are some other ideas? What if we did this? So we can change the geometry of the hole that we're providing to give ourselves more surface area. A uh, five point star, that may not be as much surface area as we would like, but if we went to maybe an eight point star, we could uh, increase the surface area of that hole as much as 40%. Um, other types of geometry may give us more. What about this? Additively, we can do these types of structures. We can create these shapes. We can create these geometries. They can do what we need to do to help us become more efficient and only putting the material where we need it. This is how thinking differently is being applied to added manufacturing. So designing for additive. It's just like designing for traditional manufacturing, but we just need to change our thought process. So we, let's have a little basic understanding of what that process looks like, and let's take a look at some file formats. First of all, STL. Uh, if you're curious about what STL stands for, I always thought I knew, but it's actually standard tessellation language. Uh, you could interchange tessellation with triangle, so it could be standard triangle language, but this is pretty generally uh, what the STL is. So it actually describes using triangles, the CAD geometry or the real surface that is created in the CAD model. And it uses triangles to, to do this. So an STL file format is used by digital manufacturing software as information needed to produce the 3D model. Uh, we actually have some controls over the STL when we're outputting. We can control the angular uh, tolerance or the angular deviation. We can also control the cordial tolerance or deviation. So when we talk about the cordial tolerance, here we have the triangle that's represented by the CAD model and this red line here is the CAD model. So the deviation we're talking about is the distance between the cord of the triangle and the actual outside true surface. So the smaller that is, the less faceting we're going to see. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So here we have uh, an export settings out of SOLIDWORKS for uh, an STL file. And uh, there's some three separate resolutions you can choose coarse. Uh, and you can see we have about 45 thou. Uh, there. Uh, here we have uh, an angle of about 30 degrees. And you can see how faceted of a model we get coming right out of the CAD data. If we change that to a custom setting, we can adjust this down to 1,000 and maybe three and a half degrees. And you can see you can get a much smoother surface uh, just by making some very minor adjustments in the export options. Uh, in SOLIDWORKS, when you change your file save as type to STL or any of these options, by the way, you will get this options button that shows up. So any of these file types, you, when you choose this options button, that will take you to the export options and that's how you can make some adjustments. Uh, in my experience, uh, 1,000 and 7.5 to 15 degrees gives you a good enough result on the export. Uh, another CAD or an, another file format is VRML uh, or pronounced Vermal. Uh, also, VRML, it, it's interchangeable there. It's been around since uh, before 95. Uh, this is known as a virtual reality markup language. Uh, it's most useful when you want color to come across. Uh, that's really what this was designed for. It's allowing those graphics to come across and be part of that uh, dumb model. AMF, additive manufacturing format. Uh, this is becoming a standard uh, across a lot of different platforms. Uh, it's the open standard for describing objects for additive manufacturing processes such as 3D print. It's an XML based format designed to allow any computer aided design software to describe the shape and composition of any 3D object to be fabricated on a printer. Unlike its predecessor, STL, uh, AMF actually allows for color materials, lattices, uh, constellations to come across in that format. 3MF, 3D manufacturing format. Uh, another XML-based design format for using for additive manufacturing. 
this also allows colors and other information to come across uh, that can't be represented with an STL. So let's look at some tips for designing out of FDM or FFF. So we're gonna talk about uh, a few things to think about. We're gonna talk about some understanding of orientation and supports and how that's important. And then we're gonna have a case study. So let's jump in. First, let's talk about tolerancing. Uh, this is specific to the Z direction. So whenever we're laying down material uh, in an X, Y orientation, and then we go to the next layer, we want to make sure that we are as close as possible in our thickness so that it is divisible by the overall height of the part. So for example, if we have a layer thickness of 15 thou and the top of the part is exactly one inch, we're not going to be able to do that because 15 thou is not divisible by one inch. So that means we're going to have a little bit of deviation from where we really want the top of the part to be. So we want to make sure our layer heights match to our thickness the best we can uh, from a for being divisible. So let's have a look at some creative structures. This is a very generic looking part. Uh, I just have some shapes in here with some do's and don'ts that I want to talk about. The first thing I want to talk about is upside down fillets. That's a, a no, no. We don't want to do that. Uh, in the center there, you see a couple of uh, diamond shapes, that top one there. We, again, we don't want to do that. The other three are good, but we want that top one to come to a point. And what we're talking about here is we have self-sustaining angles. So this is considered a self-sustaining angle here and here. And when it comes to a point, we don't need any support there. We're going to need to build support up to hold up that upside down arch. Also, circles, if we don't need them, let's don't use them. If you have, uh, if it's a locating opportunity, you need a pin to fit in that hole. A pin will fit in a diamond shape just like this, just as well as it will a circle. As long as you have an, a, a circumscribed piece of geometry over that hole, it'll work just fine. Here we have another self-sustaining angle. So we have this teardrop shape. So if you really want to use a circle, let's put a point on the top of it. That way we've got self-sustaining angles and no support generation would be required. If we have a look at this in a, uh, a general slice, this is what we're going to see. You see that support structure had to be built all the way up to support the top of that arch, where on the other side with the point, it's not necessary. The whole circle, think about uh, this angle here, 45 degrees is a, a typical angle. Anything in between there is going to need to be supported. That's why when we use a teardrop shape, we don't need any support. Here's another creative structure. Uh, here's a, a thing where maybe what we need to create actually has uh, a port or something that's gonna get threaded in there. Okay, fine. So we're gonna make that round, but we would be able to reach in and get support out of there from you know a, an inch or two back, depending on how far we are. But if we transition that shape to a diamond, now we have a self-sustaining angle that doesn't require support that goes around the corner and coming back out. So now we actually have a unique structure in order to eliminate as much support as necessary on the inside. Uh, this is called the YHT rule. Uh, and this is nothing I can take credit for. I found it online. Um, there's actually been a, a couple of people that have all, also used this as well. Uh, so let's think of uh, support as scaffolding. And with a Y, because we have a self-sustaining angle, we don't need any support there. So if all three of these faces are doing the same thing, maybe they're holding something up, they're stopping faces or something to like that, we want to make sure we use the most efficient geometry possible. So when we have a self-sustaining angle, we still have a flat face on top and we're good. Uh, if we look at the T, this is a cantilever. So it's going to require support structure built all the way up from the bottom. Now the H, this is kind of a bridging scenario. So the more distance we have, there's going to be some sagging of that filament that happens as you go across the, that H. And until you get enough filament built up in there for it to go straight across, then um, you're going to have, you know, some loops hanging down. Um, another thing you can do is in this gen uh, general area, you can slow down the speed in the X and Y 
and that will allow that material to cool a little bit more as it's coming out, giving it a little less opportunity to sag. So uh, think about using a hot glue gun. If you were pushing the hot glue in there really fast and moving your hand really quickly, you're going to get a big string coming out. If you were to do it really slow, you would actually be able to have a, a little more control over how much of that stringing is going to happen. Same philosophy, same principle. Uh, let's move over into this widget on the bottom side here. Um, this is just a generic part. It was actually part of a much larger structure. Uh, but what I want to talk about here is this stopping face back here. So a plate is going to slide back under here uh, for positioning. So this face here is for stopping. And what the engineer did here was they created this pocket. So if there was any debris or clippings or trimmings or anything like that, as the plate slides in there, it would push those, those back and it would fall into that trap. And then we wouldn't need to worry about uh, not being flat against our face. It's a really good thought. It's, it's learned from experience. Now, the problem when it comes to additive is they use a circle to do this. And the top of that circle requires support. So this entire little channel back here is filled with support. And that requires a dental pick to get in and pick that support out. Uh, it's, it can be a challenge. So if we look at it from a different perspective over on this other side, I use an inverse chamfer. It accomplishes the same task as this side. It gives a, a place for those uh, clippings or trimmings to go. And it's a self-sustaining angle. So we don't have to worry about uh, any support that needs to be in there that has to be removed. Uh, also, I've got a couple of a diamond here and a circle. Uh, the circle is going to need support. The diamond is not because it's a self-sustaining angle. Uh, the same works for bosses uh, as well. If you have, um, you know, a locating option, um, circles are what we always use because typically we'll drill a hole and stick a pin in there uh, or a dowel or something like that. But if it's just for locating, then it doesn't need to be a circle because this is going to require support to be built up all the way around it. Where in a lot of slicing softwares, if you only have that one single edge, that's all that needs to be supported because we have self-sustaining from that. Here's a quick example. You can see on the slice, the Y has no support at all. The H and the T both require support to build up. Uh, also over here, the circle you can see requires support where the diamond does not. And you can kind of see back here in this back corner, there's support in that channel where here you can see there's no, no support at all. So let's move on to a case study. Uh, so I had a previous uh, job where I was actually in charge of helping tooling designers and engineers learn how to design for AM. And I would let them uh, test it on their own, and then I would come talk to them and talk about what they need to do. So this particular example, this guy had no previous experience, and uh, he was challenged to design a fixture that would position a flat plate into a sidewall so that it could be tacked in the proper location. Uh, there was a gentleman sitting next to him who had been doing some design for additive already, so he had some input to help him think about this. And this is the, what they came up with. So when we first look at this, we can see there's a lot of good things happening, self-sustaining angles, uh, removing geometry where it's not necessary for uh, to lighten up the part, uh, less material is necessary. Uh, so we see here the initial design time was four hours. And the print time was going to be 21 and a half hours. And that is a real cost of our internal costing structure for 3D printing um, at $557.76. And if we look over on this other side, uh, the red is actually the build material and then the gray is the support material. So to build this part was going to be almost 25 cubic inches of material. And the support was going to be 19 and a half inches. And all of that money is thrown in the garbage. It has to be dissolved away, broke away. It, it, it has to be removed and it's all down the drain. So it's really throwing money away. So <clears throat> I came and took a look at their design. Uh, we talked for a few minutes. We talked about what's important, what's not important and what features are really required to obtain that objective. So what we talked about were like these posts here. I asked what these four posts in the corners were. They told me that's uh, on the sidewall. That's what we're using for locating. I said, okay. 
uh, what about these little items here? What are they used for? And that's where the plate was gonna rest on so that they could tack it in place. So what we see here is we have four pieces of geometry and three more pieces of geometry that are all important. So let's start there and then see what we can do. Uh, next question I asked was, what about these pieces here? I assumed they were handles. I was in fact told those were handles. So my question was, look at all the support that has to be used in order to create those handles. We could literally go out to a drawer, use a dollar handle and screw it on. We could put a couple of holes here and screw a handle in place. It eliminates the, nest, the need for all of that geometry underneath. I also noticed that there's a different thickness here. So why is this one thickness and this another thickness? Uh, and they're thinking, well, we were wanting to lighten up the part. Again, they're using some of the correct thought processes, but the geometry looks like it should be made out of steel. Uh, and that's what I tried to get them to think about. So we had that conversation, and this is what they came up with. They used the four locating points. They used the three faces, but instead of in the other orientation, they inverted them. So now we can use the self-sustaining angle coming up. We also have self-sustaining angles coming out. And we're making more of an X shape and getting rid of all of that geometry on the outside that's completely unnecessary. We can see their new design time took two hours. Uh, it would take about eight hours to print this. And uh, it would be a new cost of $195.27. We look at the material being used. We've overcut it in half of the amount of material. And the support has gone to near nothing. Uh, the original part had a part number over here. So that's what all this support structure was for, was for that part number that was embossed. Uh, we took that out. So this, all of this support would actually be removed as well completely unnecessary. Uh, you could put on the top surface here, the part number, maybe the bottom surface. So it just didn't need to be where it was located. So what does this mean? The cost of the original is nine, five fifty seven seventy six, and 21 and a half hours to print. The new design was $195.27 and the time to print is eight hours. That's a difference of $362.49 and 13 and a half hours of printing time. Time is money when we're talking about printing. You have to charge for the usage of the machine. And when you can simply change your design philosophy in your process and save over $300 on one item, that makes it more valuable. So let's look at some tips uh, with some stereolithography. Uh, this is just a collection of design parameters that I took from 3D Hubs and um, some of our own technicians and what they express uh, they were able to learn. So let's talk about supported walls. Uh, walls that are connected to other structures, uh, at least on, on at least two sides, they will have little chance of warping. Uh, these should be designed with a minimum thickness of about 0.4 mil or 16,000. Unsupported walls. These are walls that are connect or not connected on any more than one side. And they, these are gonna have a higher chance of warping because as the blade sweeps across, uh, they would have an opportunity to, to uh, wobble a little bit. Uh, that would be in the leveling process. Uh, so another thing we'd want to do is try and um, orient this part in such a way that you wouldn't have the side sweeping action hitting directly on this face. You'd want to hit it at more of an angle. Uh, that way there'd be less surface area to try and hit and, and knock that wall over. Overhangs. Uh, these really pose little issue with stereolithography. Uh, unless the model is being printed without adequate internal or external structure or support structures, it's really uh, not necessary. Uh, any support structure that would be added would be underneath here that would be easily wiped away. Uh, if you're not wanting supports at all, you wanna try and keep that uh, to less than one millimeter in the angle of at least 19 degrees from level. Raised details, including text. Uh, any features on the model that are raised slightly above the surface around them should have at least one mil, I'm sorry, a point one mil height. Uh, that's so it can make it visible. Uh, if you get too thin, it starts to actually blend in with the surface and you don't see it nearly as well. Uh, engraved details, including text. Uh, this needs to be a little bit deeper. Uh, just it's the way the, the resin works. 
Um, anytime you have two sidewalls and you're creating what's called a trap volume, maybe, uh, that liquid's going to be harder to come out. So you want to give a little bit more depth, uh, about 0.4 mil. Uh, bridging, horizontal bridges. Uh, bridges between two points on a model can be successfully printed, but the designer must keep in mind that the wider the bridge, or the wider bridges must be shorter. Uh, that's because there's more surface area when you're dragging across in the sweep operation. So uh, if you've got short bridges, you want to get a little bit more surface area uh, than usual. Uh, holes. Holes of a diameter less than a half mil or 20 thou in either the X, Y, or Z orientations, they may close off during printing. Um, it just depends on the spot size that you have and what type of detail you can get down to. Uh, in our experience, um, the smaller holes in the X, Y are easier to do than they are in the Z direction. Um, also, if the holes are really small, uh, you could always consider creating a cone shape. Uh, and that's going to be no more than an indexing, so you can come back and drill out the hole to the proper appropriate size to begin with. Connections. Uh, so if you've got moving parts, you want about a half mil between them. Uh, if you have uh, an assembly where things are going to kind of come together, you want to have about two mil or 0.2 mil. And then uh, if you have a nice push or a tight snug fit, uh, you want to have about 0.1 mil um, clearance. So those will actually fit together. Uh, if This is definitely going to require some testing. And uh, these are just some baseline parameters to start with. But if you're using different materials, you, you really want to make sure you do full testing so you know um, exactly what kind, type of geometry you're going to need. Uh, okay, to wrap up here, a few things to keep in mind when designing for AM. Uh, use your experience. So design for residual stresses. Uh, all of these use heat to some extent. Uh, so we all know that residual stresses can be uh, found whenever we have heat. So we want to make sure we're accounting for that. Orientation is key. No matter what type of process for additive manufacturing you're using, you want to make sure you get the best orientation for that process. If you're doing FDM, uh, you want your strong direction to be in the X, Y. Uh, the Z is going to be weaker. Do not always take the slicer defaults. Uh, there's always opportunity to go through the slice layer by layer and look for areas that you could have trouble with, and then you can make adjustments. Uh, design techniques can be cross-functional. Uh, this isn't specifically for, for FDM. It's not specifically for SLA. They can actually work kind of together. Uh, so you can design for one and at, uh, one operation, and it'll actually work for another really well. Uh, also, these concepts can be used for traditional subtractive manufacturing. Uh, I had a student tell me in one of the classes I was teaching that he's actually applied a lot of these concepts to his steel design work as well and um, found a lot of success. So uh, just some, th some things to think about when designing for AM. Well, that brings us to the end of this. Thank you very much. If you have, an op or have the opportunity, would like to have a harder copy of this, you can always download an ebook right from our website. Thank you. You guys have a great day.